Hello, it's Scott Manley here. To an outside observer, launch windows can seem mysterious. We're told that a launch is planned for a specific time, and if it misses its time slot, it may have to wait another day or even more before it can try again. And that's even before we get to the weird superstitious people who like to point out that Apollo 13 was launched at 2.13pm. Launch windows can sometimes be instantaneous, with no delay tolerated. Other times the rocket has minutes or even hours to get going, and teams on the ground are racing against the end of the window to get the vehicle checked out for launch. Sometimes missing a short launch window can force a wait of months or even years before another opportunity comes along. And then there's the case of Mariner 1, which was supposed to go to Venus, but a programming error on the rocket caused an early failure. So the teams worked fast to understand and fix the problem for Mariner 2 because they needed to get it out in the same launch window. A lot of launch windows are defined by orbital mechanics, matching up planetary alignments to launch vehicle performance. Outside of the launch window, the rocket simply can't throw the payload fast enough to get there. In other cases, it might be about ensuring arriving at the destination in the right orientation to reach a planned landing site. And then there's some really mundane conditions like illumination of the rocket during takeoff or re-entry. Recently we had the FAA banning daylight launches so even the bureaucrats can get in on launch window design. All these factors combine in various ways and a launch planner needs to do the math, crunch the numbers and account for things like mass of the sun, the distance to Mars and the obliquity of Earth's rotational axis which is a perfect segue into this video's sponsor. Novia make the hover pen, a well-crafted pen with a special base that lets it hover. Yes, you can bump it around, you can twirl it, and you can muse on the fact that this is arranged at an angle of 23.5 degrees, which is of course the angle the Earth's rotation makes to the ecliptic. This is a helpful reminder to me when I'm using it to do the math to navigate out of Earth's orbit to other worlds. I can't promise you it will make any of this easier, but more people will stop to check out your work when they see this functional piece of art, which incidentally Time Magazine recognised with an award for best inventions. These are fantastic gifts, especially for that relative who has already bought everything they need, because nobody thinks they need a magnetically levitating pen until they see this pen hovering on its base. Novium built these out of the same grade of aluminium used by spacecraft, and it's available in multiple space-inspired colours. And for people who want a literal link to space, there's a premium version with a slice of meteorite in its tip, specifically a nickel-iron meteorite formed in a protoplanet's core in the earliest age of the solar system. That planet was shattered and a chunk fell to Earth over Scandinavia about a million years ago. It broke into many pieces which have survived four ice ages before being unearthed by meteor hunters. Point is, as a space rock nerd, this is legit. So by now you probably know who you can gift a hover pen to, and since you're here I can offer a little bit of a deal. If you use my code SCOTT or follow the link in the description, you can get 15% off all hover pens for the next 72 hours, 10% after that. And uh, the store will offer free shipping to most countries, North America, Europe and Australia and more. But let's get back to talking about shipping spacecraft to other planets. Let's start with an easy one. Starship Super Heavy test flight. What was the reason for the launch window there? Well, the early launches all happened early on in the day because they wanted the launch of this new rocket to happen during daylight so they would get the best view of the vehicle. But for the Starship re-entry, they wanted it to come down at night so it would be easy to see the debris as it burned up. But after successful Starship landings on Flight 4 and Flight 5, the schedule changed so that they wanted to see the landing during daylight. So the launch windows moved to the late afternoon just before sunset, still providing daylight visibility, but then Starship would move downrange into the night and as it was re-entering, it would pass into daylight for the final landing. So that's some really simple, easy to understand launch window planning. Now let's move into low Earth orbit missions. If you're a player of Kerbal Space Program, you probably already know that spacecraft which are being launched to rendezvous with another, say the International Space Station, need to be launched into the same orbital plane as the target. Because changing orbital planes once you're in orbit takes a lot of fuel. If you are off by only one degree, you need to change your velocity by 136 meters per second or 450 feet per second. That is about half the total maneuvering capacity of the space shuttle. 
And in spaceflight, by the way, of course, we talk about change in velocity as delta v, and mission designers really want to pick trajectories that minimize the delta v requirement. This applies to a lot of the other launch windows that we'll talk about. So launching into the correct orbital plane means waiting until the launch site rotates under the target orbit. So this leads to an instantaneous launch window, or rather, two windows per day, since typically there's an ascending and a descending pass. But depending upon the launch site, there might be restrictions on the launch azimuth that stops you launching on one of these opportunities. For example, launches uh, to the International Space Station out of Florida have to launch on the ascending pass to the northeast because the descending pass to the southeast would require launching over the Bahamas. Now, you might not be rendezvousing with another spacecraft, but you might still need to launch into a specific orbital plane for the mission. For example, if you're launching a constellation of satellites, you might target a currently empty orbital plane between existing planes of satellites. Another restriction might be sun-synchronous orbits, which are special orbits that rotate around the Earth once per year, keeping them in the same position relative to the sun. And one version of this I experienced regularly was an orbit which moves along the day-night terminator to avoid Earth's shadow and remain constantly illuminated. This is good for solar panels, right? Now in the US, this typically means launching just before sunrise out of Vandenberg. So I'd have to get up really early for these West Coast launches and then find that they were foggy because they were on the coast and it was dark and cold. So these orbit plane limitations can apply to other destinations because, of course, the spacecraft typically launch into a parking orbit before relighting the engines to head to their target. But to figure out what the initial parking orbit is, we need to start at the destination and work back to the Earth. So let's start with traveling to other planets, interplanetary travel. As all the planets move around the Sun, their positions change relative to each other, and very specifically, relative to the Earth. And you want to choose an orbit that goes from one to the other that minimizes the delta v requirement to do this. Now, the classic way to go efficiently from one circular orbit to another is the Hopeman transfer uh, trajectory, which is an elliptical orbit that has the perihelion at one orbit and the aphelion at the other orbit. And this is the kind of thing I was taught to do with pen and paper back when I was at college. But of course, these days, we use computers for everything. What we tend to do is use a tool called the pork chop plot. So these are useful tools. They're 2D, 2D graphs where you have like the departure time along the bottom and the time of flight up the side. And for each point, you can figure out where the start and the end point would be in space. And then you would find an orbit that connects these two. And then at the Earth end, you can then figure out how much it differs from Earth's orbit. And that gives you the change in velocity needed to leave Earth and get onto this orbit that reaches the target. This makes it nice and easy to read chart, which shows times where the travel to a destination is possible. For planets, these low-velocity opportunities occur regularly based on what's called the synodic period. This is essentially the time between when two planets line up at the same point opposite the Sun. For Pluto, it's moving very slowly, so the synodic period is almost the same as one year, 366.7 days. Jupiter moves a bit faster, so the period is about 399 days. Venus orbits faster still with the Earth, and it lines up every 584 days, but Mars is the worst one, taking 780 days between lining up for Mars launch windows. So typically you have maybe a few weeks where the rocket has the performance to be able to reach the target. That's your sort of broad launch window. But to figure out the exact time of day that you have to hit for each of those days, you have to take your, tar your calculated orbit in deep space from your pork chop plot, and then you project that back towards the Earth and figure out where it would have to have come from in low Earth orbit. And there's actually multiple solutions to this. So you ideally aim for the ones with the lowest delta V requirement. And also you might have to throw these things out if the required parking orbit isn't accessible from the launch site. It's common for interplanetary missions with modern guidance systems to be able to accommodate launch windows that last a couple of hours and it's because they can change the calculations over time. But again, the way that we determine this is by starting with that interplanetary trajectory and rewinding it to figure out the parking orbit that it must have come from. Incidentally, on port chop plots, we've talked about doing delta V, but actually the velocity we put on a port chop plot is the velocity at infinity squared, which is known as C3. Okay, this is basically the energy left over after the object has escaped Earth's gravity because 
That part of the calculation is the state after leaving Earth's influence, and it doesn't care how you got out of Earth's gravity well. That's kind of an important distinction. Anyway, so now we have the Moon, and this is actually explained really well in a NASA film from the 1960s, which is worth watching for more detail. The Moon orbits the Earth at about 384,000 kilometers, and its orbit is inclined by about 5.1 degrees, except that this inclination is relative to the plane of the solar system, not the equator of the Earth, right? Because most satellites orbiting the Earth are relative to the equator. So this 5.1 degrees can add to that 23.5 degrees in all sorts of ways. It means that the Moon can be as far as 28.6 degrees north or south of the equator, depending upon the phase of the orbit and you know how, how things are aligned. So now, to get from low Earth orbit to the Moon, you make what's called a translunar injection maneuver, and that creates a highly eccentric orbit with the closest point, the perigee, in low Earth orbit, and the furthest point, the apogee, out beyond the Moon. And a basic bit of geometry with orbits shows that the perigee and the apogee are on opposite sides of the Earth. This means that if you know where you need to get to the Moon, you can calculate the location of the Moon at that time, and then draw a line between the Moon and the Earth, and on the opposite side of the Earth, where that comes out, that's more or less where you actually have to fire your engines for a translunar injection burn. Right? That's really convenient. It's called the antipode. So now, because of orbital mechanics, you can know how long it takes to get to the Moon on the trajectory you're going to use. The free return trajectory, of course, of the Apollo missions. That was typically about 80 hours, although that can vary depending upon where the Moon is in its orbit. So now you look for a launch trajectory which takes the spacecraft into a parking orbit which passes through this injection point a couple of hours after a launch because Apollo did need to check out the spacecraft after they reached orbit. They needed to verify its orbit was correct and all the systems were running. So now that gets us to the Moon at the chosen time. How do you figure out when you want to arrive at the Moon? Well, you look at the landing sites, because the landing needs to have the right kind of illumination. The Sun needs to be behind the lunar module as it's descending, and it needs to be at an elevation of, of between 7 and 21 degrees, so that the astronauts can see the topography of the terrain by the shadows being cast. Since the Moon rotates about 13 degrees per day, that means if a mission doesn't lift off on the target date and has to wait a day, it would have to switch to another landing site, moving westwards across the surface over time. Now, to be able to reach a specific landing site, the spacecraft would have to fine-tune the inclination of the orbit, the lunar orbit, when it arrives. So the surface propulsion module enabled them to actually pick landing sites from a band of latitudes during that uh, capture burn, during the uh, lunar orbit insertion. But they would have to make the decision before entering the orbit. For each monthly launch window, there's a limited number of landing sites which are possible because the orbit around the Moon was controlled by the translunar injection trajectory, and that was controlled by the relative positions of the Earth and the Moon. You get this? That the, where you're landing on the Moon is really important for deciding when you launch from the Earth. Uh, there was another way, by the way, to modify the target latitude. Remember how I said that uh, you figure out the translunar injection burn? based upon like this line on the other side of the Earth. So you make sure your parking orbit passes through that point. Well, orbits can actually pass through a point in two directions. It can pass through a descending trajectory or an ascending trajectory. And since uh, Apollo launched out of Florida and would descend down over the Atlantic, the early opportunity would be a descending insertion. And as they traveled around to the other side of the Earth, towards the Pacific, if it crossed over the Pacific, that would be an ascending trajectory going to the northeast. And that north or south motion translates to a vertical motion with respect to the plane of the Moon's orbit. So if the Atlantic injection is taken, the spacecraft initially goes down below the plane of the Moon's orbit and then rises up back to meet the Moon. So as it swings around the backside of the Moon, it ends up being north of the lunar equator and the orbit on the near side ends up lower latitude in the south. But for the Pacific injection, the reverse is true, right? The orbit goes over the, uh, over the near side of the Moon, and the, once, it, once it comes around the near side of the Moon, it's at higher latitudes. And you can see this in action because Apollo 15 and 17 
The, the landing sites for that are a long way north and both of these had injection burns which happened over the Pacific so they could use this to reach those higher, higher latitudes. Apollo 17's landing site was also furthest east and that meant that it was the only Apollo mission that was launched at night which of course was quite something, the only Saturn V to launch at night. So to summarize this, they would start with a landing site knowing the time that they would need to get there. They would extrapolate that back for, to a lunar orbit, to then a transfer orbit, and then to a low Earth orbit, and then find the launch window which produced this orbit or that passed through this point. And that's what they had to work with. The Apollo launches had windows that launched that lasted a couple of hours because they could change the launch direction as the Earth rotated by a bit but they could only change the launch azimuth by about 26 degrees because downrange they needed to pass close enough to a ship that was monitoring the trajectory so that after the engines burned out they were able to verify that they were in the correct orbit. These, all these factors come together to make sure that they were able to get into the correct orbit at the correct time and there was a lot of math involved. So anyway, I hope some of you found that interesting. Perhaps some of you even learned something about hopefully you're less mystified about why launches happen at certain times and what goes into actually figuring out that when that happens. If you feel inspired to do something with pen and paper, then yes, the hover pen offer is there. Uh, make great gifts and they do actually help the channel. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.